Hey everybody, welcome back. Hey Paul, good to have you back with us on the show. Today we're talking about the third pillar of Catholic social teaching, and it is subsidiarity. Welcome to Pope Francis Generation. It's the show for Catholics struggling with the church's teaching, who feel like they might not belong in the church anymore, and who still hunger for a God of love and goodness. Your hosts are me, Paul Fahey, a professional catechist. I'm Dominic, someone who needs catechesis. Together, we're taking our own look at the Catholic Church, her teachings and practices from three views that changed our world. And those are the Kerygma, the Doctrine of Theosis, and the teachings of Pope Francis. Together with you, we're the Pope Francis generation. Okay, Paul, subsidiarity. This is a fun word that nobody uses. And so what does it mean? Why is it important? Yes. So when I uh, teach RCIA, in the very first class, I always tell uh, the candidates going through, uh, the church has a name for everything. Uh, the church has its own vocabulary. So, so subsidiarity um, is the third of the four pillars that we're going through of Catholic social teaching. So we've had the first is the infinite dignity of the human person. Second is the common good, subsidiarity. And then uh, later this season, we'll talk about uh, solidarity. So subsidiarity is this principle within Catholic social teaching that's focused on participation. Um, if the principle of the common good is about our responsibility towards others, if like responsibility is the key word for that, for subsidiarity, the key word is participation, which is related to human agency or human freedom. So it's this principle that we give, we owe a deference to uh, people's, individuals, human persons, agency, and ability to participate in bringing about the kingdom of God and in healing and in healing their communities and bringing about justice in their communities. So that's what it's focused on. It's about helping individuals participate in the flourishing of their communities. So this comes from this idea of, uh, of participation it comes from the fact that uh, like we've talked about before, human beings are made in the image and likeness of God. And therefore we are free creatures. Um, God who is free created us in his image and likeness um, with freedom, with this radical capacity uh, to reject our own good and even to mm -hmm. reject him, right? Mm -hmm. God didn't make us as, as robots or um, as pets, right? Mm -hmm. But as free creatures precisely so that we can love. Mm -hmm. So the root of love is freedom. So in, in Catholic tradition, love is defined as choosing the good or willing the good of another for their own sake. So implied in that is freedom. I, mm -hmm. I think we've talked about this before where like our pets can show us affection, but our pets can't actually love us. They can't make mm -hmm. the free choice to put mm -hmm. our good above their good. Right. 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 But human beings have that capacity because we're free and God respects that capacity. So um, back in season one, we had an episode on uh, the virtue of chastity mm -hmm. and chastity as Pope Francis defines it is uh, freedom from the desire to possess the other. Mm -hmm. and, he, and in that teaching, he says that God loves with a perfectly chaste love because he allows his free creatures to even go astray from him. Right. So our, our freedom is, um, so we are called to model God's love for us and respect other people's agency and other people's freedom. Um, so that's, so this principle is rooted in that aspect of human anthropology, that aspect of our human nature, that we are free creatures and that that freedom must be respected. Mm -hmm. um, so we, so we have this um, desire within us though. And if we go back to that definition of chastity, we have that, we have this fallenness, this broken desire within us to possess and control others. Mm -hmm. That didn't exist before the fall, right? That's a part of concupiscence. That's a part of our, our, our fallen nature. Mm -hmm. um, so that is something that this principle of subsidiarity is addressing. It's this antidote to this mm -hmm. need, this desire we have to possess and control others. 
Does that make sense? Yeah. So it's like the, um, so it's the opposite of totalitarianism or um, centralizing or to, centralizing of too much or too much opportunity or goods or so on. Um, I've understood subsidiarity. I, I like the way that you've actually put it here because the way <laughs> where that's been parked in my brain is simply, um, what is it? It's allowing the that the specific level of responsibility to handle the problems at that level. Um, and I probably butchered that, but no, no that's so, about right. Okay. So like a, a higher level or a higher tier of responsibility isn't going to step in and interfere and take control of and fix all of the problems at, at lower levels. They're going to allow the, the person closest to the problem to solve that problem and to allow that. But so that's the way that I've been thinking of it, which is kind of a, like a, a top-down allowance, which isn't exactly accurate. I like how you've inverted that. It's like, no, you are allowing everybody the, f the, the freedom and the agency to participate in the, the construction and the influence of creating solutions around them or at their level and having the freedom to collaborate with others and in networks and communities yeah. and whatever. Uh, I like how that comes back to the person as the, the center and the focus of things. Yeah, and, and as we'll talk about, sometimes it's a higher level of authority um, just giving allowance to lower levels. But I think just as often, if not more often, it's higher levels of authority actively empowering mm -hmm. lower levels so that those lower levels have greater agency. So it's not simply right. a hands-off, right. not my responsibility. <laughs> it's a mm -hmm. actually my responsibility is to help empower others. Mm -hmm. um, um, I... I and I want to go back to scripture for like a couple different things that I think uh, underpin this. Okay. Um, so one is that uh, in in the creation story, in the Genesis story, when uh, when when God created human beings, He tasked humanity um, with with working and keeping the garden. Right. Mm -hmm. Adam's task was to to work and keep the garden, mm -hmm. and uh, these verbs, work and keep, the the Hebrew uh, words for these verbs are avad and shamar, which is mostly just trivia, um, except for the fact that those are also the verbs that the Old Testament uses to describe the work that the priest did in the temple. Mm -hmm. Something about work, keeping and tilling a garden mm -hmm. is priestly work. Um, and what this is, is that we are tasked, human beings, as creatures made of the image like and likeness of God, as icons of God, as idols of God, is another way to translate it. So in the Old Testament, the Babylonians, the Assyrians, like all these uh, all different cultures and religions, in their temples, they had idols. And they were actual idols. They were little carved statues of their local gods. And when they would get into conflicts, you know, one city would attack another city, and they'd actually like raid the city's temple and cart off all the idols and hold the gods ransom because the, the statues not only represented the gods, but in some way they, mm -hmm. they were those gods. Right. 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 So then when you think about the commandment that God gives his people to not worship idols, mm -hmm. part of the reason for that commandment is because human beings are already the living idols mm, of that's God. Incredible. Yeah. Okay, so within us, within our very identities we had made in, made in the image and likeness of God is that we have a priestly nature. We are mm -hmm. representatives of God, mm -hmm. living representatives in the world. We are mediators between uh, God and his creation. Mm -hmm. Our work is priestly work. Our work is to, um, just as God, you know, in the very first words of scripture, Right, the spirit hovered over the chaos waters and mm -hmm. he brought order to chaos. Our work, even if it's, you know, garden work or mechanic work or accounting work, mm -hmm. is to bring order to creation, right? Right. Is to participate in this craftsmanship of God. So God wants us to freely participate, to continue the priest though like the work that he's doing to bring order to creation and that is our priestly uh work as mediators 
we continue to do the the work of God in creation. Mm -hmm. um, so freedom and cooperation and participation are all a part of this work. Um, so some of that work is physical work, like we've talked about, but some of it's also spiritual work. So you can look at the story of the Exodus and where God freezes people from Egypt and there's the 10 plagues. And on the 10th plague, the Passover, uh, the like narrative kind of pauses and God gave instructions to Moses to give to the people. And for like a whole chapter, there's these detailed instructions for the Passover meal. And uh, God tells his people, all of you, you need to find a lamb. It has to be a young lamb, a year old, it has to be a male, it has to be without blemish. So it has to be without, you know, illness or, or wound. You have to kill the lamb. You have to drain all the blood from the lamb. You have to put the blood of the lamb on, on the doorposts of your house. You have to cook the lamb. You actually have to roast the lamb. You have to eat it with bitter herbs and you have to eat it with sandals on your feet and staff in hand, ready to go whenever the Lord calls you, right? Really specific instructions. Because God says, I will pass over. I myself will pass over Egypt and kill and kill the firstborn. But when I see the blood of the lamb on the doorpost of your home, I will pass over your house and you, and you will be free. You will be safe. Okay. Mm -hmm. Why is God asking his people to do this? He doesn't need his people to mark their house for him to know which houses belong to his people and which houses belong to the Egyptians. He doesn't need us, but he wants us to participate in his saving work. He wanted his people, the Israelites, to in some way participate, have investment, cooperate with. We need to step up to the plate, do something that marks for ourselves. Yeah, but here's the thing is like, this this ritual is useless it actually does nothing um <laughs> it's like it's like it's like god's a you know master painter and we hand him a crayon drawing right like what he asks for is not like he's not asking us to actually do the work he's just asking us to participate in the work that he's doing mm -hmm. because he respects our freedom and he desires our participation so saint augustine has this principle where he said, God created us without us. We didn't have a choice in being created or not. But he did not will to save us without us. Mm -hmm. Even if our participation doesn't look like the plagues, doesn't look like the crossing of the Red Sea, even if our participation is just cooking a lamb, right? He still desires our participation. So within human nature is like built into that we participate in god's work both in the material world in bringing order where there's chaos but mm -hmm. also in salvation both our personal salvation and in the salvation of the whole world we participate in what god is doing mm -hmm. now this is different from a like like pelagian view which is going to say our work is what's effective our work is what's important Mm -hmm. If you look at, again, if you look at the story of Exodus, the cooking of the lamb, if you step back, you're like, well, that's pretty useless compared to the works that God's doing, the plagues and the crossing of the Red Sea and the pillar of cloud and fire and all of that, right? So <laughs> God's starting the work, making the work fruitful. He's, he's doing all the work. He's just inviting us to participate in a small way in what he's doing. Mm -hmm. um, so... I think that principle is important then when we talk about um, that's the way God treats us. So if that's the way God treats us, that's the way that we ought to treat others, mm -hmm. that we ought to allow others to participate in the work that's going on. And, and I think this happens in families um, instinctively. Like I, I have young kids. Um, I invite them to participate in what's going on in the house, right? If we're making a big meal, I invite them to participate. Now, all, the adults make, you know, we just said Thanksgiving. My adults make, the adults make the Thanksgiving meal. The kids set the table, right? Do we need them to set the table? No, we can set the table. But we want them to participate in some small way that they can. Right. 
Um, mm -hmm. yeah. We want them to like push the shopping cart when we go to the grocery store. We want them to participate in the family in a small way. Um, we don't want to micromanage their entire lives or, or do everything for them without ever asking them uh, to be freely involved. This is a this is a part of human community too. Right, right. For their own benefit, for their own um, their own engagement and interaction uh, with reality to to form themselves through their own activities as well. Um, that's a, I, I love that metaphor. That's exactly what is happening, as you said, with the Passover. Is God's letting them push the cart? Um, yeah, he's able to do it, but they also need to know that. I mean, that's the thing about raising an intelligent being. It also has to feel like it's involved. It was part of the process. It had a choice. Otherwise, you're just being uh, dragged um, yeah. as if you didn't have a choice. Yeah. Or you're just being superseded and ignored and everything's being done without you. Yeah. You're either being neglected or you're just being controlled. Mm -hmm. Yep. So then this brings us to actually talking about subsidiarity. So this is from the catechism. Uh, it says that excessive intervention by the state can threaten personal freedom and initiative. The teaching of the church has elaborated the principle of subsidiarity, according to which a community of higher order should not interfere in the internal life of a community of a lower order depriving the lower order of its functions, but rather the higher order should support the lower order in case of need and help coordinate its activity with the activities of the rest of society, always with a view to the common good. So, so we're going to unpack this. So mm -hmm. your initial uh, definition is, is right. This, this is what we're talking about here. Higher levels of authority shouldn't invade and trample, you know, get involved with lower orders of, of authority. Mm -hmm. um, so that's present. Also, the last line is really important. The goal of all of this is the common good. Mm -hmm. And, you know, from talking about the principle of the common good, our conversations with like Tony and Nat and things like that, we understand that the common good is that everyone in society has what's necessary to not just survive, but to live a life of dignity. Now, this doesn't mean everyone needs to have a vacation home and a boat, but it means everyone needs to have adequate shelter, food, education, health care, employment, mm -hmm. etc. The bare necessities. Right. So subsidiarity is ordered to the common good. It's about mm -hmm. helping to bring about the common good it's about the best way. What's the best way to bring about the common good in society? What's the way to do that that best respects human dignity? This is what subsidiarity is about. Um, so then uh, what this means is that the lowest level of society, the lowest level of a community that can solve a problem ought to be the ones to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. At the heart of it, that's what this means. Mm -hmm. um, because that, uh, because that ordering most respects individual freedom. Um, and also practically it's the people who are closest to the problem mm -hmm. that usually have the best insight into how to solve the problem right. most effectively. Right. Um, in our conversation with Mark Shea, uh, and he used this example and this example is in his book as well, where he talks about how, like if someone's hungry and they, and they need a loaf of bread, they shouldn't call the president about this problem. Uh, they shouldn't even call 911 about this problem. They should probably just go to the store and buy a loaf of bread, right? Mm -hmm. um, but what if they're unable to do that, right? What if they're sick um, and they can't leave the house? Sh should they then call the president? No. Should they call 911? No. Should probably call a friend or a family member to go and get that for them, right? Mm -hmm. But what if they don't have money to buy a loaf of bread? Well, the responsibility kind of keeps moving outward, right? Well, why don't they have enough money? Like, don't they have adequate employment? So this is a problem with access to employment, right? Um, what if their sickness prevents them from being employed? Well, now we're talking about access to health care. Um, what if they're being denied a job 
um, because the community that they live in uh, is racially discriminatory. And, and they're like, well, because of your skin color, you can't be employed here. Mm-hmm. Well, now, now we have to kick the can higher. Maybe that actually is a problem for the state governor or for the president to solve, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so there's a sense of being able to understand what the problem is and understand what is actually uh, the level of community closest to that problem um, that can solve it. Now, often, especially in, I don't know, especially in the U.S., all I know is U.S. Catholic culture. Um, In U.S. Catholic culture, this is often viewed uh, as um, suspicion of higher levels of authority. Mm -hmm. Um, Subsidiarity is often used to justify, well, we need smaller government. Um, And that's not the case at all. Uh, Actually, the church has always been supportive you know, at least um, since Vatican II, always been supportive, and before Vatican II, of both national governments and in, and international governing bodies. Like the church has always been supportive of the United Nations, for example, right? Because right? they mm-hmm. see that those levels of authority have essential roles in society. Mm-hmm. Now, they shouldn't have every role in society, right? but they have important and essential roles in society. So the principle of subsidiarity shouldn't be suspicion towards higher levels of authority. Mm -hmm. It's simply that higher higher levels of authority have a proper place and they should stay within that proper place. Keep right on going, teacher. (laughs) Um, So as we said before, this principle is ultimately about giving people the opportunity to participate in their own development and the development of their communities. So um, back in 2020, uh, the Pope gave a catechesis on subsidiarity and he said this, persons must be agents in their own redemption. I love that because that harkens back to the Mm. Exodus story, right? Mm -hmm. We need to be free agents in our own being saved. Even if God's the one doing all the work, Mm -hmm. we still need to be agents in our own redemption. And he continues, Everyone needs to have the possibility of assuming their own responsibility in the healing process of the society of which they are part. So what the Pope is saying here is that I have a particular responsibility to my local community, to my family, and to my Mm -hmm. local community. And because of that, um, because I have that particular responsibility, then... um, (laughs) I ought to be one of the agents to help make that community better. Mm -hmm. Okay. The Pope continues. The principle of subsidiarity allows everyone to assume his or his or her own role in the healing. Sorry. The principle of subsidiarity allows everyone to assume his or her own role in the healing and, and destiny of society, implementing it, implementing the principle of subsidiarity gives hope. It gives hope in a healthier, and more just future. And I think what the Pope is getting at here is there's something in work. There's Mm -hmm. something in being able to be a free agent, to freely Mm -hmm. participate in growth and development and healing Mm -hmm. that is good for me. Yes. I like the way that you referenced um, Adam in the garden and so on, and the, the call to humanity in the garden. And that, as you said, the, the verbs or the, the words used uh, are, are meant to be or are direct reflections of the priestly activities in the temple. And what I find so interesting about, about that is what is the function of a priest in the temple? It's to minister to the, the altars and the rituals and the sacrifices and the, the praise and the worship of, of God in that tabernacle. I mean, we don't do it because it elevates God and it, and it makes his life better. Um, we're not serving the high king where all of our daily jobs keep his belly full so that he can focus on taking care of the kingdom, whatever. It's a totally different relationship. Um, I love the one description where someone says, I can't remember who it was, holiness is like fire. It's like heat. And that was the understanding the priests had 
being present or being closer to holiness made you holy too. At least that was the plan, that was the idea, unless you're actively doing something otherwise. Um, and we, I think we see that in our daily lives. We meet people who are genuinely holy and we start to feel different. It's like being warmed by uh, a fire and it's, it's contagious because it's just, it's so beautifully human and delightful because it is God active uh, within us. And that's desirable. It's, it's want something that we want. Where am I going with this is the priestly activity in the temple is not for the benefit of God. It is for the benefit of the priests and the people for that process of inner transformation, the tending of the inner garden of the person's soul. That is the ultimate work of life. And how well we're doing that work of making and clearing space in our egos for God will directly translate, I do believe, into how we're then taking care of each other, the creation itself, the environment, our families, our communities. Um, so if that work that Adam is called to is partly an exterior work of taking care and, and bringing order to the constant chaos of just nature kind of pressing on us and stuff, which happens all the time. But it's also the insistent inner work of making room for the Christ child of that, that kind of incarnation for every single one of us. It is that both end and that, that fascinates me. Um, uh, so everybody, that's the, the universal call to holiness. Everybody is called to that level of work. Uh, and if you take that away from anybody, um, well, it makes me think of that line where Christ says, you know, the better a millstone is thrown around your, your neck and you're thrown in the ocean to taken away freedom and the chance to work and to be effective within your context, uh, to do good and to do and to, uh, yeah, live out God. Yeah. So, I mean, and the church will even talk about how people have a right to work, which the church doesn't certainly doesn't mean that in uh, an exploitive way that people ought to work or whatever. But it, but what it means is that it's a work is something good for the human person. Mm -hmm. It's good for me to work. Now, that work can look really different. That work may be, you know, in the marketplace, uh, selling things, offering services, manufacturing things. But that work is also like, I don't know, like taking care of a baby or taking care of a home or um, being creative, writing, painting, etc. This is all work. Mm -hmm. um, it's all bringing order to chaos in some way. Some do that through administration. Some can also do that through dance, yeah. which is a form of language, which brings order to a lot of what's going on inside of us. Music is another kind. I like you mentioned before we started recording the sense of there are many different charisms, like what is it, 20 or something that are found scattered throughout scripture. Um, and each, some are completely different, like miracle working on one side. If that's your charism, your gift, it's a form of work. And I think a, it's important, I think, not to flatten work down into this is what I got to do to get paid so I can get through life, so I can act, so I can have a life. It's like, no, 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 it's, work in the in an ideal world ideal sense which we should all be working towards is how how is this an expression of my talents and gifts and capabilities based on who i am and where i am you know what i can do that brings good and creates some order out of out of chaos in my life or maybe somebody else's life yeah so work like employment and private property are tied to the principle of subsidiarity as well. Mm -hmm. So um, we talked about um, the universal destination of goods when we talked about the common good. Mm -hmm. And we talked about how that relates to the right to private property and how the right to private property comes from the universal destination of goods, which is the goods of the earth are meant for, belong to all humanity. Mm -hmm. So they're not there yet. We have vast inequality, which means that there's chaos mm -hmm. and there's ordering. Plenty that of work to do. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> there's there's work that needs to be done. And the church has said that the best means for that to happen is through private property. People, mm -hmm. individuals taking personal responsibility 
for the resources that they have. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so this is part of the reason, uh, that the church condemns communism is that, uh, that because communism rejects private property and, and the church is like, no, that's really important. Actually being able to be mm -hmm. personally responsible for these material goods, your personal material goods. Um, so private properties, um, a part of subsidiarity, because it's a part of being able to be an agent of redemption an agent of healing and justice and development in the community. And it's, it's, um, not just allowing you the freedom, it's recognizing you should have the, the, the freedom to impact your environment, your context. Yep. Um, and then even beyond private property, and this is, this is where we move into works. So this is from the catechism. It says, everyone has the right to economic initiative. Everyone should make legitimate use of his talents to contribute to the abundance that will benefit all and to harvest the just fruits of his labor. So just as you were saying, everyone has talents and gifts to give to the community. And we have the right to use those talents for the good of the community. Again, it says that will benefit all. So what we're hearing here is the language of the common good. I have the right to use the gifts and talents God has given me for the sake of the common good. And I have the right to, to the fruit of my labor. I have the right to benefit from the fruit of my labor. I should not be alienated from the fruit of my labor. Um, and I think, and I think this is where, and, uh, I, I haven't, I haven't read enough. Uh, I haven't read enough Marx to, to have any type of competent opinion here, but he talks about like labor being, being alienated from the fruit of their work. Right. There's something mm -hmm. about like, there's something dehumanizing about being, uh, a cog in a machine mm -hmm. and not actually benefiting from or participating in the fruit of my work, which is different than think, think of, uh, think of like a small business owner or even working for a small business mm -hmm. where even, uh, you know, a sales clerk at a small bookstore, mm -hmm. um, may have some say in yeah. the policies and, and direction of that small business. You know business. what I think is, is interesting about that, though, is how do you define the word fruit? Like the fruit of one's labor might be different for different people. For some people, it might be um, smiling faces and shining eyes, and that is worth it to you, and that's why you work. For somebody else, it might just be the money. And so yeah. being somebody who's at a steel mill and you're just um, – helping to make bridges and, and everything that steel does. So if that's the case, then one could see like, I don't know, over taxation or um, taking away your money and siphoning it out to you. Uh, it's somebody else's. I don't know. It, it, I think if it's just that though, which, which I don't think is a problem. Mm -hmm. um, this is where the church, I think would give a preference for like employee owned corporations. I'm sure. Yeah. Right. Where employees directly, like mm -hmm. they, they are given more responsibility in, yeah. uh, in the organization. They're able to more directly reap the fruits of, mm -hmm. of, of the benefits of the organization. And they take on the risks of that, of that organization. To me, that seems like greater participation mm -hmm. and less alienation. Right. Yeah. So then underneath this or or within this is um and this is one of the one of the core teachings within catholic social teaching is the rights of workers if, if we go back to the first social encyclical rarum and Avarum, in the 1890s mm -hmm. it's a, it's about labor it's about labor rights it's one of the that's one of the like that's the pressing issue uh, on pope leo's mind this is mm -hmm. this is the middle of the industrial revolution you see huge um, exploitation of laborers yeah. around the world. So the rights of workers um, is a key. <laughs> it's a key part of Catholic social teaching, and it's a key part of Scripture, right? Like not paying a laborer his due is one mm -hmm. of the four sins named in Scripture that cry out to heaven directly. 
it's mm-hmm. next to like murder. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So the rights of workers, like all other, all other rights are based in the nature and dignity of the human person, right? I have infinite value, infinite dignity. So I have certain rights. So one of those rights are, or some of those rights concern, uh, uh, labor and working. So uh, the church's teaching, um, lists. So this is from the, this is from the, the, the compendium of the social doctrine of the church that John Paul II put together. It lists the rights of workers. Here they are. The right to a just wage is the first one. It's the most important. We'll spend some more time on that. The right to rest, meaning you shouldn't have to work like 80, 90, 100 hours a week, right? Um, you, you have a right to have time off from work. Uh, the right to a safe working environment. The right to freedom of conscience in the workplace. Your employer should not force you to do things that go against your conscience. The right to appropriate subsidies that are necessary for the subsistence of unemployed workers and their families. Um, The right to a pension and to insurance for old age, sickness, and in case of of work-related accidents. The right to social security connected with maternity. And the right to assemble and to form associations or the the, the right to unionize, right? Mm -hmm. These are the rights of workers that the church lists. the top one being the right to a just wage. Any thoughts here, Dominic? No, I think it's um, the and the key reason why we're talking about this in relation to subsidiarity is bec- it's it's trying to ensure that the entire system is present to all levels of the system. And the one that gets forgotten the most are all the little bits and people down at the bottom that are the easiest to ignore. And if everybody is, uh, which is what has happened so frequently, um, and why so many people are mad at what's happened with jobs and scandals and business and so on, is it's been so easy to take a voice, take their voice away yeah. uh, and to um, reimagine how pay structures work and how inflation takes away you know, uh, that just wage from people. Um, I think (laughs) things have gotten, things have changed in the last 20 years very quickly. And I think we found a way to get our voice back. And I think having these kinds of discussions are very important so that one, we're all talking about healthy and appropriate things, but also that our anger is uh, oriented appropriately at the, the chaos that is inflicted on a lot of people who have lost good work. Um, or having to do inappropriate levels of effort to find work that can sustain their families. Um, anyhow, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the, if I have the right to be an agent of my own and my community's redemption and healing and development, um, I can't do that without without the resources to live. I can't do that without the resources I need to thrive. Mm -hmm. Um, And the way that I do that is sometimes through like nonprofit charity work is sometimes through just personal initiative volunteering. But I mean, a lot of my time is spent in the marketplace, right? So work, employment, so the means by which not only I get the resources to be able to participate in the in the community, but it itself is a participation in the community. Mm-hmm. So uh, that's why this this is related to to subsidiarity, and I think that's why alienation from the fruit of one's labor mm-hmm. or lack of access to dignified, meaningful work in the first place. Mm-hmm. are so dehumanizing to people because it cuts off their ability, our ability to participate mm-hmm. in the development of our communities. Um, so the key right of workers here then um, is the right to a just wage. And I think a lot of the, a lot of the economic injustices that we have in the world and a lot of the other rights that 
uh, uh, economic rights that the church lists would be solved by simply having, simply, <laughs> by merely, right? Um, if we just had just wages, it would solve a lot of problems. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, so this is how the church defines a just wage. Mm -hmm. A just wage is sufficient to support the worker and their dependents. Um, it allows them to put some away for savings and leaves them time for leisure. In other words, if someone works full time, they should have enough money for them and their families who are dependent on them to have food, shelter, adequate education, access to health care, etc. Mm -hmm. And nobody should have to work 80, 90, 100 hours a week yeah. to achieve that. That's what this is saying. So I think it's fair to say that a just wage is more in like contemporary language, a living wage. This is what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, if someone's working full time, the church is saying they are owed a wage sufficient to meet the minimum demands for themselves and those dependent on them, like the, the minimum um, material needs that need to be met. Mm -hmm. um, so this is from the compendium. It says this um, because one of the challenges to this is, well, workers, if workers freely agree to being paid something, then that should that should be sufficient, like whether or not that covers all of those needs. Well, they agree to it. So that was their free choice. That should be sufficient for a just wage. And the church says no. This is from the compendium. The simple agreement between employee and employer with regard to the amount of pay to be received is not sufficient for the agreed upon salary to qualify as a just wage because the just wage must not be below the level of subsistence of the worker. Natural justice precedes and is above the freedom of contract. So someone is owed, if they, again, if they're working full time, um, adequate levels of material substance. What is that word? Subs subsistence? Subsistence, sorry, that's what I mean. Okay, okay. Right, so that's like the minimum necessary to survive. Right. Um, so even if I agree to being paid less than that, mm -hmm. the church is saying that's still an unjust wage because mm -hmm. the church recognizes there's a power dynamic in here, right? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. that I may not, me as the laborer, I'm in a, um, I'm in a weak position, a vulnerable position mm -hmm. to negotiate. So either I get paid nothing and not have a job at all right mm -hmm. or i get paid not enough and the church is saying well it's actually it's on the employer it's on it's the responsibility of those with power and authority mm -hmm. to make sure that justice is being done here um the church takes this uh extremely seriously because scripture takes this extremely seriously. Um, so the compendium goes on to say that they commit grave injustice who refuse to pay a just wage or who do not give in due time and in proportion to the work done. And rooted in this teaching is the scripture from uh, the letter of St. James from the New Testament. And he says this, Come now, you rich, weep and wail over your impending miseries. Your wealth has rotted away, your clothes have become moth eaten, your gold and silver have corroded, and that corrosion will be a testimony against you. It will devour your flesh like a fire. You have stored up treasure for the last days. Behold, the wages that you withheld from the workers who harvested your fields are crying aloud, and the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on earth in luxury and pleasure. You have fattened your hearts for the day of slaughter we've talked about before, these words are like vinegar. They are not like honey. Mm -hmm. Unless you're a laborer who is not being paid enough mm -hmm. to survive. And then these words sound a, a lot like honey, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that there's, 
I think that there's something to this, right? By paying a just wage, um, by paying a just wage, uh, wealth is being distributed more efficiently, right? Mm -hmm. There's a complaint, um, especially when talking about subsidiarity, that uh, that we need to have smaller government. That the government shouldn't be um, giving handouts to people, shouldn't be um, doing welfare, shouldn't be giving um, uh, um, lower rate or free health care, things like this. Um, that the government shouldn't be involved in those things um, because the government's inefficient because any number of reasons. Okay. But if people were paid a wage to be able to pay for those things themselves, then the government wouldn't need to be involved. Right? There's something mm -hmm. here like if the market actually paid wages that were mm -hmm. sufficient for people to live and provide for food and clothing and healthcare and education, mm -hmm. then the state would hardly need to be involved in those things in the first place. Mm -hmm. In a sense, you can say that large employers, um, you know, you can pick on Walmart, you pick on Amazon, whoever, large employers who chronically underpay their employees are actually like intentionally forcing taxpayers to subsidize uh, the wages of their employees. If they're not paying employees enough, uh, if they're not paying employees enough to live sufficiently mm -hmm. and those employees have to get, uh, get welfare from the taxpayers, from the state, the corporation is sh like <laughs> intentionally yeah. putting taxpayers on the line instead of taking responsibility for those employees themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I remember once reading about um, uh, with the development of the last 2000 years, sort of the fall of Rome, the fall of a lot of ancient cultures. One of the things that uh, changed was people got to keep their, their finances home as opposed to all of the, the taxation that would constantly be sending all of their surplus and more far away from their homes. Uh, every every great civilization and culture did this, where they were siphoning off all the colonies, all the provinces, and and uh, feeding all of the gold and all of the precious metals and everything into the capital cities, into the centrals to uh, to make absolutely stunning works of art. But the problem was how many millions and millions of of lives of, of people never had a chance to to thrive in any way and just remained um, uh, as as peasants underfed for the longest time and then there were certain things that happened for example uh england kind of broke away after a while or just was ignored and they got to keep all of their the fruits of their labor and they plowed it directly back into their own country and then they became absolutely an, one of the fastest growing and earliest and thriving sort of places for human flourishing. Um, and I think we're, we're seeing that kind of bounded back and we're now in the first world West, the, the, the wealthiest we've ever been because of our ability to plow back into our own fields and our own lives, fruits of our labor. But we are now at a point where, I don't know what you'd call them, new oligarchs have found creative new ways to siphon off this stuff. Like you just described with bigger businesses or whatever. There are some, I'm sure, who are doing good, uh, but I think we're mad and we're taking out credit lines and all of this uh, in a lot of cases uh, because it is being abused as well. Yeah. I mean, ultimately, if those in authority are siphoning off resources from the populace in some way, those on the margins, et cetera, they're really siphoning off agency from people. Um, and human nature is such, uh, you know, and these are, these are the great stories of like revolution, which are often ex ex extremely violent and bloody because human beings don't, <laughs> uh, they rebel against living that way. They mm -hmm. rebel against their agency being stolen from them. Mm -hmm. Um, that's why inequality, economic inequality is a huge problem. 
Mm -hmm. um, it's a huge problem in part because um, it is it is sinful and unhealthy, spiritually unhealthy for the rich to be rich. Um, Jesus warns of this throughout. But also, inequality leads to violence. You you have, I mean, you know, so many stories are like this. Uh, but think of like uh, the Hunger Games stories, right? Where all the districts <laughs> are, um, some of them in destitute poverty. Yeah. And then the capital cities just like, uh flush with everything i just watched um elysium with matt damon over the weekend and realized huh this is a robin hood story all over again <laughs> all the rich have siphoned everything off and left everybody in terrible living conditions and it leads to violence no yeah um unfortunately <laughs> often almost pretty much every time this is a really consistent thing when i talk about uh the church's teaching on the rights of workers and just wages someone will comment and say but the church doesn't actually practice this herself uh that is pretty much an inevitable point that is made mm, yeah and uh it's a fair and accurate point that is made like um i worked full-time uh at a parish for many years and they treated me well, uh, uh, salary wise, um, especially like in comparison to, um, like what I saw other people being paid in the area and, 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 and things like that. Like the parish I worked for more so than most parishes I was familiar with took paying employees seriously. But even then, even if like the parish I worked at was like top shelf, I was never paid enough for my family not to qualify for Medicare. Mm -hmm. I, my family always qualified for it because I was never paid enough to not qualify for it. Right. Yeah. Like the state was, <laughs> was subsidizing my family, even though I, I was working full time mm -hmm. for the church. So it's like you're saying, because that's an option that the state provides companies, whether religious or not, uh, are pricing themselves or, or budgeting themselves around key, uh, allowing people to live at that I, bottom I, line. And I'm not sure that's intentional or not. And and I'm not even sure it's because the state's offering it. I think it's because those basic necessities aren't being met by the marketplace. So therefore, the state has has to step in and provide right. them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. This is like like this is a real problem um uh a few years ago my diocese started putting together a like committee ad advisory committee on catholic social teaching and w when i saw that my first thought was well the first thing they should do is tell the bishop he needs to pay all of his employees more because what credibility do we have to tell anybody else to follow catholic social teaching if we're not mm -hmm. if we are not exemplars of it ourselves in the first place um, but that's not just the responsibility of like the bishop and the pastors and the administrators. It's the responsibility of the whole church here. So um, I give a retreat on Catholic social teaching. And um, in one of the discussions, someone brought up like, well, it just seems really like the government's really inefficient, like in providing for the needs of people. Like, wouldn't it be better if the church, like, was the one providing uh, for people? And I'm like, yeah, maybe in an ideal world. But then I brought up the example of, like, I was, like, um, I need the state to give my family health insurance, <laughs> even, mm -hmm. even though I worked for the church, right? Uh, the church doesn't do a great job with providing for the needs of people. And um, the, the pastor of the parish I was giving this retreat at, like, he jumped in. And in my head, I'm like, oh, shoot, I think it just threw him under the bus or something. <laughs> um, but he was really gracious. And he's and he was like, yeah, it's really difficult as a pastor because he's like, we don't we don't have the funds to pay employees of the parish mm -hmm. what I want to pay. And I jumped in and I'm like, yeah, because. Right. What is Vatican II 
like what's the church who's the church everyone who's baptized is the church so when mm -hmm. i say and when the church says when the magisterium says like the church as an employer needs to pay employees a just wage it doesn't just mean the pastors need to pay employees a just wage mm -hmm. it means everyone mm -hmm. all of the parishioners need to take a responsibility yeah for the wages of everyone who's working mm -hmm. for the parish everyone yes. in the diocese needs to take responsibility for those who are being employed by the diocese. And I think for a long time, the church got really used to an overabundance, or at least an abundance of priests and religious sisters mm -hmm. who didn't need that much mm -hmm. versus lay people who have four or five kids. Those, those, <laughs> those wages are very different. <laughs> yeah. Um, kind of piggybacking off of that, uh, either yourself or somebody said, like in an ideal world, the church would take care of a lot more of this stuff. And I don't remember who it was I read in the last month or so, but they made a point that struck me as very, very interesting. And it resonates with exactly what you just said about we, us taking care of each other. They made the point that when when the first hospitals and restaurants were created, they were they did a good, and they continue to do a much a much needed good. I love Chick Fil A <clears throat> and whatever the local hospital, but there's a downsides to that. Because what we've now done as a culture is we've kind of told ourselves, if you have a need, go there. They will take care of that. And if you have a food need, go there. So we've outsourced a lot of this. And so when a stranger comes in our midst or somebody who is in pain or in trouble, we've gotten really good at outsourcing them, pointing them or creating these designated areas where this is where you go to take help. As opposed to every house in the community opening its door to take care of the stranger and to, to feed the hungry, to, to take care of each other. And although there was a good, there was also a loss of uh, a sense of agency of every home in a village, you know, in a community um, to embrace each other. And I thought that that hit home for me. Um, and I don't exactly know what the answer is, but I think it's a beautiful, um, like a reflection and a discipline that one, it does return some agency and some power back to the individual home for us to ask ourselves what is appropriate perhaps in in my situation to do that could is good for my community how can i help you know um where that's possible to do good and to put good back into the community to you know as opposed to outsourcing that um yeah that's that's interesting because there's definitely pros to outsourcing like i mean well, especially for specialization you know yeah that but, sort of thing but even like, you know, someone calls a local parish and says, I need help with my rent. Um, I need help with my heating bill. I need help with whatever, right? Financial help. Um, like some people take advantage of parishes and there's some level of responsibility, I would say, to like checking up on this person and like being involved with this person enough to know like, well, what do they actually need? Like, do they need cash mm -hmm. or would like calling the utility company and paying the bill directly? You know what I mean? Like there's a lot yeah. of work there and there is, um, it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort to be able to do that. So is it better for every local parish to devote the time and resources to doing that? Or is it better for five local parishes in a county to all put money towards a agency and the agency specializes in that. Hmm. So there's an there's a, an efficiency in outsourcing for sure. But I think the problem you're pointing out is, yes, that's good. But the potential risk or cost of that is that individuals lose their sense of responsibility to that. And um, they stop participating. Yeah. And I think that's the key. I think that is the key. So as we uh, start to wrap up, what do we want to leave people with? Yeah. So I think to summarize then, um, the root of subsidiarity is participation. God desires for each of us to participate um, in his saving us uh, and in his bringing about healing and justice and peace to the world. So subsidiary is about participation and it's about em empowering and not disempowering others. 
It's about higher levels of authority. And whether empowering means stepping back and letting lower levels do their thing, or if it means intervening in a way that's fruitful. Um, I think of like, uh, like international charities, um, like just stepping in to, um, to like a developing country or, uh, or a country that you know, like, was like, um, Haiti got hit by a hurricane, like international agencies stepping in and just doing everything themselves can destroy the local economy mm. that versus international agencies giving resources and money to the local economy mm -hmm. to help it build and provide and, and meet the needs of the people there. So like, it doesn't mean don't ever step in. Sometimes it may mean that, but I think often it means to like step in in a way that listens to the actual needs of the people on the ground who need the things. Right. To listen to them, to take their needs and their experiences seriously and to then empower them. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't you say that this is exactly, it's this principle in action that we see with the Holy Father and all of his synods on synodality. Oh, absolutely. It's yes. this return to subsidiarity as opposed to an overemphasis on the needs of the hierarchy. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Now, within the within the ecclesial, within the church community, there is a hierarchy with it. But this m moving to the margins to listen is definitely a move in the direction of subsidiarity. It's, it's inviting mm -hmm. people, encouraging people. It's grabbing them by the hand to bring them in to help them participate more to, to, to take what they have to say and what they have to offer mm -hmm. more seriously than we than we've done in the past so yes i think the senate is absolutely that um and then economically like respecting the rights of workers and paying just wages is a is a way of doing that it's about mm -hmm. giving the the resources and the agency to the people on the ground who are building families and participating in their local communities um so what do we walk away with? I mean, like with the common good, there's a sense of responsibility. And I think we start there because subsidiarity is rooted towards mm -hmm. achieving the common good. To reflecting. Not just being, yeah. Not just being given the freedom, but in our case, asserting the fact that it is our, uh, it's a right to be responsible and yes. to take action. Yeah. So thinking about, praying about, how, what am I responsible for? Not just me and my own, but beyond that, what am I responsible for? And what are the ways that I can participate? What are the ways I can participate in my own family and in my own communities, but then even, even beyond that as well? Where's the Lord asking me to have initiative and to have agency? Um, which are big questions, um, but they're essential questions, I think, for how are Catholics, how are Christians called to participate in their communities? Um, right. Yeah. I like that. I like that. It's uh, This message is, is it's wonderful because it's, it's not like uh, just shut up and take more communion and that'll solve everything. It's like, mm, yes, I have more communion, maybe, but do something with the that. grace is still helpful <laughs> still <laughs> necessary so we want to take a moment to thank our sponsor for this past year which has been wonderful supporting um select international tours because people in the holy land have a very difficult time making ends meet and so uh when you do choose select international tours for planning your pilgrimage uh, to the holy land um select international tours is a 501c3 uh, charity company. So they are helping Christian families to thrive in the Holy Land. So they're a small company with a big heart. Every one of the pilgrimage trips helps to support and fund these families. So if you're ready to travel or you're looking to lead a group of your own, take the next step in your pilgrimage by visiting selectinternationaltours.com. Uh, if you appreciated this conversation, please do hit that like button. It does help more people to hear more about uh, what we've talked about today and the work that Paul is doing. Paul, if folk have questions or feedback, where can they go? 
Yeah, you can uh, visit me at popefrancisgeneration.com. Uh, uh, you can you can subscribe there. Um, I share the podcast there. And I write there and have other projects as well. Um, you can become uh, you can become a paid subscriber and help support the work that I'm doing. Um, I'm not able to do any of these projects uh, with without your support. So that's definitely appreciated. Fantastic. That's why we're so happy at Smart Catholics to get behind podcasts like this, the work that you're doing. Um, so this show is brought to you by Smart Catholics. It's the online community for Catholic millennials, creators, and learners who want faithful conversations, unafraid of doubts and questions. Um, and if you don't get that Bible ready from shows like this one, uh, I don't know, maybe listen again. So if it sounds like you, come and check us out at smartcatholics.com, and we're free of trolls and ads and toxicity. Uh, Till next time, friends, say a short prayer for yourself and for us. And remember, don't be afraid to ask questions. Doubts can be a sign that we want to know God better and more deeply. God bless you.